I'm Rose Tremaine. Here I am in London on a very cold evening and uh, hoping to talk to you about some of my work. I think this is something which has been quite confusing for my publishers, that I work across several genres. I do like working with history very much, the so-called historical novel, um, but I also like to not neglect contemporary subjects. I wouldn't like to be categorised as only a historical novelist. Um, the, the, the next question that always comes up is, is, it, is the experience between the two very different um, in terms of research, the research you have to do and the feat of the imagination that you have to put into it? And I say that for me it isn't really very different. I do a lot of research for the contemporary fiction and obviously I do a slightly more for the historical fiction. But the thing with research, it seems to me, is that you have to do it very well. Um, and then, in a sense, you have to forget it. You have to make it yours. Um, I read novels where the author has clearly done a lot of research, and that research appears in the book as data. And that is not what I like to happen in my books. I like the research, in a sense, to be invisible, whether it's talking to people about their experience that I'm writing about in the present, or the the reading and, um, and looking at pictures that I've done from the past. It has to be digested, um, absorbed, it has to be alchemized. And I've always been, since my very, very early um, beginnings as a writer, uh, and I still believe this, that the imagination is, has fantastic power and that we don't have to have experienced something uh, to be able to write about it. I think, I think, yes, with contemporary fiction, um, unless, um, you know, unless I was writing about my own life, which is something I've <laughs> avoided doing, um, and I think will continue to avoid doing. Uh, there are, I suppose there are bits of me in my books, um, parts of my childhood, people I've known, displaced, disguised, and so on, but I haven't drawn very much on my, my own biography. So it means that, as an example, my novel The Road Home, was about um, a young man coming from Eastern Europe to work over here, and he's had a terrible time. Everything has been taken away from him. His wife has died. Um, he's lost his job. Things have gone very badly for him, and he comes here to try and make a new start. Now, it was very important for me um, to understand what people like him actually felt. So I spent a lot of time talking to mainly Polish workers in the area of England where I live, which is Norfolk, who were working um, mainly in, in fruit picking and vegetable picking. And I got a lot of individual stories. I, I mean, I said to them, it's not that I want to steal your stories. I don't want to steal your stories, but I want to st understand how you feel, and particularly how your parents feel, your parents who have been left behind in a world that perhaps they no longer understand. Um, so that took a lot of time and a lot of patience. And again, as I said just before, um, those stories had to sort of be digested in my mind and um, embellished and added to and taken away from. Um, so it's part research and part imagination. And I would say probably kind of 50-50 of, of each. I think there are a lot of decisions you have to make before you start on a novel, and um, one of the most profound decisions, which may come early or it may come late, is what voice you're going to tell the story in. And um, for the historical novels, I've experimented a lot with voices. Um, for the, the, the books that I'm most known for, Restoration and now Merivale, which has just come out, which is the sequel to Restoration set in the 17th century, um, I didn't want to use a pastiche because it's very annoying for the reader. Um, but I did want to seize a kind of heightened language, which is not quite the language of today. It is completely understandable as the language of today, but it's, it's a little bit embellished and heightened and idiosyncratic. Um, and finding that voice was absolutely crucial to being able to write that narrative. Um, it was quite interesting, again, um, well, you know, in every medium we have experiments that go wrong. And when I started Restoration, I started it in a, an ordinary voice, my voice, the, the third person narration voice. And um, I wrote about, I don't know, 50 pages or something in that voice. 
and then I read it through and I thought this is really boring this is really flat and boring um, what's wrong and I decided straight away it has to be the man's voice which you could say it's a dangerous thing to do. I'm a woman writer. Could I write a whole novel in the voice of a male narrator? And I thought, well, you know, stick to the imagination, stick to your beliefs that anything's possible. And once I was away with this this male voice, it, it just sort of, it, it started to amuse me, it started to entertain me. And um, I think that's another thing, by the way, that's very important about writing, is that you don't get bored with it. <laughs> this thing about who is your your core reader, who, who are you writing for? And you know, every writer would have a different answer to that, but, but my most truthful answer is that I'm really writing for myself, to entertain myself. Um, I resisted the idea of writing a sequel to Restoration for a long time because sequels are d dangerous, you know. They have to be as good as or better than the original book. So I resisted it, but uh, I think it's also true to say that I was very fond of my nar narrator for, uh, in Restoration. He was kind of calling to me across the years. Um, and I thought that um, to pick him up again when he's 16 years older, I mean, he's in his late 30s in Restoration, and in the new book, Merivale, he's in his 50s. We don't think of that as being very old, but in the, in the 1660s, 16, well, we're in the 1680s, that he would have been considered almost like, you know, on his last legs. So I was very interested to see what he made of the last third of his life. And this is a subject which I've explored in, in a couple of contemporary novels as well. Um, the, the problems that we face when, when we pass the age of 60 and we begin to see the shape of our lives and we begin to see that there's more time in the past than there is in the future. And how do we come to terms with that? Do we make the right decisions about what we're doing, about the people we love, about the things we... Are we in the right place? Um, and what, you know, how are the things in the past that need resolution which haven't got it? And these are universal subjects, and I'm always striving, incidentally, you know, through contemporary fiction and through the historical fiction, to find a universal thing, so that the, 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 the what the the ideas which the book are, the book is exploring it actually are common to us to us all. And I think this is common to us all when we get to this stage in our lives, that um, we we have a search for meaning. We we start asking ourselves these very big intellectual existential questions. Um, and to put all that onto my character, Merivelle, who is a kind of self-mocking, self-deceiving man, um, I thought this is really entertaining because he's going to be striving for this wisdom and probably failing. But then he's one of these people who he strives for something, he fails, he picks himself up, he fails again, as Beckett says, fail again, fail better. Um, and will he get there? Um, that's the question the book asks. Will he understand himself before it's too late?